So I'm going to try to go after and understand the property. If I have a long chain, that could either be random, or if I take this chain and have some segments of the chain that are turning up into alpha helix. This is a famous example, and we're talking about helix coil mixing or helix coil equilibrium, and the book goes into a lot of detail there. In principle, this is some sort of transition. We don't know what trans type of transition it is yet, and I'm interested in how much can these coexist, do they mix, and what are the average length of these segments going to be. That relates intimately to other mixtures. You can imagine having, say, let's say we have a large lake or system of water, and then we have a piece of ice in this system. So that water and then ice. But here is where things start to deviate a bit. So in general, for a three-dimensional system, you will always have separation of phases. Remember that hydrophobic effect. The reason why we get the separation of phases, uh, Lev Landau is the one who has derived this. It's not that hard, at least if we hand wave about it. This is going to depend on the surface here, right? Uh, in general, there is some sort of surface energy here. And the surface energy is first going to depend on some sort of energy, that is, depends on the interaction, and then the number of atoms or molecules that I put on that surface. If that energy is negative, it would always be good, and then things would mix perfectly. So that's not the case here. We do know that they want to separate. The question then is, how expensive is it? Well, the expense there is going to be proportional to the surface. On the other hand, the number of residues I have in a particular phase here is proportional to the volume. So here I would argue that the delta G surf, the surface energy, is roughly proportional to the number of residues raised to the power of two thirds. It's exactly the same argument as the hydrophobic effect. And what this means is that the larger the system is, this is going to go up fairly quickly. Um, so even if n raised to the powers of two thirds is not that gigantic, uh, it's certainly something that goes much faster than the logarithm of n. And the remaining components here, which the book goes into some detail, is you can place this ice in many different places, right? But that's always going to be entropy related, and that means that there are logarithms of n showing up there. So because of this surface tension here and the dimensionality, whether it's two or, two or three dimensions, doesn't matter, where it's always going to be expensive to mix phases. Now you might say that if it's spring or fall, you occasionally see a sheet of ice floating in water. That's true, but it's never going to be stable there. Um, so if you froze the temperature at that specific moment, eventually everything would turn into either pure ice or pure water. So what we're seeing there is just an effect of the kinetics. It will not happen instantly. But that's in three dimensions. In two dimensions, the world, or even one dimension, the world behaves very differently. How large is the interaction surface here? So I have one point there, 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 and one point there. And this is really constant, or at least just proportional to the number of helical elements I have here. So there is no obvious factor here that will mean that it's better to separate them and having a large piece of helix. So there won't really be an effect here that is proportional to a surface. So in, one, in a system that is one dimensional, phases can coexist. It's a very deep result in physics that Lev Landau has proposed. My point here is not going to be to rehash all of Lev Landau's writing, um, awesome as it is. But the point is that for a helix coil transition, we will not have a proper phase transition. The phases can coexist and we will see some mixing. And we're going to try to count, calculate a little bit and use that to derive some delta G values.